Hello, Goodland Church. Happy Sunday, or whenever you're listening to this, um, and happy Mother's Day. I just want to extend um, a appreciation and love to the mothers in our community. And I also want to acknowledge that Mother's Day can be a really hard day for people. I know for some people among us whose relationship with their mothers are difficult or challenging or even estranged, or maybe they've lost their mother or someone who is a mother figure to them, this can be a hard day. It's also a hard day for moms who have challenging relationships with their children or are estranged from their children, or for women who have longed to be a mother and have children, but for one reason or another, have not seen that dream and that hope come to fruition. So I just wanna acknowledge that and um, just say how grateful we are as a community for the moms and the, those who have been mothering figures to us in our lives and the ways that you've invested in children and your neighbors and others. So I just wanna thank you for that before we dive into this week's sermon. All right, well, we have been in a new series, I guess it's not new anymore, so now we're about a month in, to a series we're calling That's My Favorite. And we're getting a chance to hear from uh, various folks in our church about what their favorite passage of scripture is and how that scripture has impacted them and changed their life. And to say I'm excited about the passage I get to share today is uh, to put it very mildly. This is one of my most favorite passages of scripture and it's something in my life that I have um, developed as a discipline to pray because it is a prayer found in the book of Ephesians written by the Apostle Paul and it has been my personal practice to try to pray this for myself and for others and so I thought it'd be helpful for you to know, church, how I pray for you, what my hope is for each and every one of us as we journey on this life of faith, wanting to know Jesus and to be filled with the Holy Spirit and living out a life of a disciple. So let's dive in to this passage from the book of Ephesians chapter 3. Now, Ephesians is written by the Apostle Paul. He wrote much of the letters in the New Testament. He was a man who had a radical conversion. If you know anything about Paul, formerly known as Saul, Saul was a persecutor of the early church. He, we can find this story in the book of Acts, he was standing and watching and um, making sure persecution of the Christians, the earliest Jesus followers and the earliest members of the Christian church were put to death for what he perceived as their blasphemy. Um, and so we see him glimpses of his life throughout the book of Acts when he is at um, the stoning of Stephen, one of Jesus's followers, and he's approving of that stoning. So, Paul becomes, he, Saul becomes Paul when he is met on a road by the Spirit of Jesus who blinds him and he cannot see. He speaks to him. This is a great story. So go ahead and look it up and read it on your own if you're not familiar with it. It's fantastic. And Saul turns his life over. He goes from being the persecutor to being a faithful, bold, really fearless proclaimer of Jesus and his resurrection. And so he wrote many books. He planted many churches and he traveled around um, trying to encourage these churches in their faith. And so he wrote a letter to the people in Ephesus, which was a city. And this is the thing he said that he prayed for them. And we find this in Ephesians chapter three, beginning in verse 14. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how high 
and long and wide and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. That's the passage. That's the prayer. And I just want to walk through this prayer. What is Paul getting at? What is he trying to instill in this early church? So first I want you to notice that the church in Ephesus was a church under persecution. They were facing trials. They were facing challenges. And Paul doesn't pray for the challenges to cease. He doesn't pray for their temptations or their trials to go away which is interesting because that's often how we pray, right? Which is not a bad thing to pray, but there's something really profound in what Paul chooses to pray for this church. So he doesn't pray for their circumstances or their situation, but instead he prays for their inner being, their heart, their mind. He's praying, praying for them that even if the circumstances don't change, that something in them changes. Friends, that's a prayer you and I can pray for ourselves and for others. That no matter what's happening outside, the transformation would happen in our souls so that the circumstances don't have to change, but we can be changed. Okay, so what is he saying? He, I'll start with verse 16. So I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Okay, so he's calling on not resources that we can attain, but he's calling on God to utilize the glorious riches that he has to strengthen us with power through the Holy Spirit in our inner being. One of the concepts that's pretty consistent biblically is this idea of the heart or the inner being. It, the heart and the inner being are kind of synonymous in the scriptures, right? When we think of heart, we often think of emotions and we think of our feelings. But in the Bible, heart or inner being was so much more than that. It was, another way of saying it is it's the, the seat of your mind, heart, and soul. It's the place where those things come together. It's a holistic vision of our inner lives. The things that we can't necessarily see, but you and I can assess and feel. So if it's just an emotional high, it's not the kind of heart change that Paul is praying for here. If it's just an intellectual change, that's not the kind of transformation that Paul is praying for. It's not the power that he wants to see transforming them, but instead it's this holistic soul kind of change and reorienting that Paul is talking about. So he says, I pray these things in your inner being. And then verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, those of you who have been around the Bible and church and Christianity for a while might have some questions about that statement. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Because we see in other passages of scripture that the promise of those who call on the name of the Lord is that they will have Christ dwelling in their hearts lives. So Paul isn't saying that he's introducing a new presence of Christ. In fact, I think what he's saying here is that you would know and understand, not just intellectually, not just emotionally or experientially, but holistically, that you would understand and be changed by the very presence and power of Christ in your life. And he says, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love, may have power. And then there's that power word again. So what's going on here? Being rooted and established in love. If you're around me long enough, you'll know and hear me pray this prayer for myself and for others, that we would be rooted and established in love. This 
idea here of rootedness and establishing, it kind of harkens back to the parable of the sowers. Remember back in our study of Mark, when we looked at the parable or parable of the seed, when the seed, which was scattered, was it fell on different kinds of soil, right? And on the rocky soil, it grew up fast, but it had no roots. On the ground that was trampled or the path, it was too hard of soil, so it couldn't ever take root. And then it was grew up around weeds and that grew up, but it was strangled by that which was around it. But if you remember, the seed that fell on good soil or good land, which is where our church name comes from, it produced fruit. The roots went down deep and that seed produced massive amounts of fruit. If you remember the parable, it's 30, 60, 100 fold the fruit that was planted. This is the idea here, that the love of God would be rooted in your life so deeply that with the weeds of the world and the worries of the world, with the sun and the scorching heat that you might be under, with the trampling that comes from living a life on planet Earth, your love, the love of God would be so deeply rooted in your life that it would not be affected by these circumstances. Again, back to what Paul is praying for them. In the midst of challenging circumstances, he's praying that the love of God would be rooted. Another way of saying this is that the reality of their circumstances would pale in comparison to the reality of the love of God. So he says, being rooted and established in love. This is a redundant phrase. Paul wants you really to get it. Rooted. So deep um, roots extending and immovable and unchanged by the circumstances around you, but established, meaning you're not going anywhere. He prays that they would be rooted and established in the love of God. And then again, may have power. And then he says, together with all the saints. Oh, sorry, I missed. I missed a part. I want to go back. So go back to verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Remember, I said that the promises of scripture is that we receive um, Christ, we receive his power, we receive the Holy Spirit when we proclaim Jesus as Lord. If we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouth that Christ died and rose again, we receive all of those things. But Paul is praying that they may dwell in us. I am a uh, television junkie when it comes to um, house projects and transformation stories, and I love HGTV. Maybe you're like me. Because I love the idea, especially those shows where somebody buys a house or a designer comes in with a new family and remakes the house so that it all fits the personality of the person who purchased it. Because, you know, they maybe they buy a 70s Rambler and they want it to look like a house that's contemporary and modern. And so the designer works with them, with their team, and they they literally rip down walls and make it an open floor plan and tear out cabinets and rip up floors and they they just change the whole house so that the person who lives there feels like this is a home that represents them. And that's the idea here in this passage. When we talk about dwelling, like Christ dwelling in our hearts through faith, it's, it's saying, does who Christ um, declares himself to be and the reality of who he believes does is that actually shown in our lives is it does it match up it's like moving into that fixer upper Christ is moving into you and me we're the fixer upper we are the ones who need to be gutted and rebuilt and restored from the inside out and so when Christ comes into our lives, when we receive the Holy Spirit and we come into relationship with Christ, he's working on those projects in order that our lives might reflect and look like he is filling our lives. 
that he dwells there, that this is his home. Frankly, you and I have some projects that God is still working on us. That if we're honest, we can look at our lives and say, yes, I know what it says about who God is and who I am, but my life doesn't reflect that that truth dwells in my heart. It doesn't reflect the reality that that is what I believe. And so he's working on you and me so that we can have the fullness of the gospel dwelling in us. The reality of who God is living in us, established in us. He's reorienting our life around who he is and what he's done. This is an ongoing process. I wish it were as easy as a one week extreme makeover. Now, sometimes there are some major things that happen when the Holy Spirit enters our life. Things do happen right away. We see fruit, immediate fruit. But again, coupled with this, that the love of God would be rooted and established in us. It's not just a one weekend project, but it's an ongoing project of reorienting our life around Christ so that Christ may dwell in us, may live in our lives, that may be our lives may reflect the reality of who he is. That's Paul's prayer for the people in Ephesus. That's what he longs for, for them, that they would know all of the truth that is proclaimed in the scripture, the gospel as good news, but that not only would they know it, but it would truly change their lives from the inside out. And Paul couples that dwelling, that truth dwelling in us with this rootedness and establishing love of God. And then he says, verse 17, that you may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love. Isn't that beautiful? That you and I, Paul, was praying for them and praying for us as a continuation of that prayer that we might be able to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Why does he use these four adjectives? Long, high, wide, deep. Why? Why doesn't he just say the love of Christ? Because I think he's getting at something that's true of the Christian experience for almost everybody, if not everybody. In that we are told, we're taught, we listen to sermons, we read the scripture, we have an understanding of who God is. We, we read the scripture about the declarations of God's love for us. But we haven't yet gotten it outside of the box. What do I mean by this? Okay, I'm a map lover. I love maps. If you, um, if you are like me, maps are fascinating because they can show all the contour lines and they show you know all different things. If you take time to examine a map, it can be really amazing. But here's the thing, maps are just paling in comparison to what they represent, which is the vast world around us. When I was a mountain guide, we would use maps to get around, but maps are wonderful, but creation is even more wonderful. And I can imagine by looking at a map, oh, this probably is beautiful. There's a lake here. There's a mountain behind here. I can cognitively, intellectually create an image in my mind of what that might look like. But often maps don't cause awe. Being there in the wilderness, looking at that lake that reflects perfectly the snow-capped mountain and the trees around, that's awe-inspiring. And I would say that a lot of people's Christian lives are map Christian lives. They know what to do and where to go. They know the distance between point A and point B. They know that there is a mountain there. They know that there is a lake there. They understand that they can't go through the lake. They understand what to do, what not to do, how to be good, how to obey, how to appear to be following Jesus. They know these things. But oftentimes it's chillingly 
absent of awe. Strikingly absent of experience of the wonder of God's love. See, you and I know that there are many, many scriptures about God's love. Here, I'll read a couple for you. Just, just a few. There are many, many. Romans 5, 8 says, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. John 15, 3 says, Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. We know cognitively that Christ dying for you and for me is an act of love. Cognitively, we can understand that. But when's the last time you experienced awe over the fact that God loved you so much, you a sinner so much, that he gave up his life for you. Jeremiah 31, three says, the Lord appeared to him from far away. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. Isaiah 43, four through five says, because you are precious in my eyes and honored and I love you, I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life, Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west. I will gather you. Lamentations 3, 22 through, 20, 22 through 23 says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy, they never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Isaiah 54, 10 says, For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. Isaiah 49, 10 says, Behold, I engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. This love of God. We can know all about it. We can see it. We can read it. We can comprehend it. We know that it's there. But Paul is praying that you and I would move beyond just knowing that God's love exists and being able to experience the breadth and the height and the width and the depth of that love. He's praying that you and I would move beyond a cognitive experience of love of God into an awful experience. One that changes you and me from the beginning. Because you see, the love of God changes things. It actually changes everything. Paul prays that we would, listen to this, know the love that surpasses knowledge. Know something that surpasses knowledge. That's oxymoronic, right? How can you know something that's beyond knowledge? Paul, I think, is getting at this idea that God's love reaches farther, digs deeper, lifts us higher and is far beyond our comprehension of it. And so he's praying that continually you will grow in that knowledge, that you would understand and comprehend and grasp and be rooted and established in the love that is beyond what you could ever ask or imagine. When we read a scripture that says the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, do you know that love? Do you know that unceasing, perfect, limitless, unconditional love that God has for you and for me? You see, the love of God is the point. Paul doesn't pray for their circumstances. He prays that they would be transformed inside out by the love of God. Friends, that's my prayer for you. Because here's the thing, the Christian life, the life of following Jesus 
is not about what we do or even our getting our theological ducks in a row. It's not about what we think about God. It's not about what we do to please God. It's not about how we act or don't act first. Because if we don't have the love of God transforming us from inside out, all of those things are useless. Yeah, we want to do good. Yeah, we want to please God. Yeah, we want to participate with the Holy Spirit as he's transforming our lives so that they're reoriented around Christ. But not because of duty, not because of obligation, but because we are overwhelmed and in awe of the love of God for you and for me. My prayer for you is that you would be able just like Paul prayed, to grasp how high and long and wide and deep is the love of Christ. And then listen to this. That you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That you may be filled to the fullness of of God. You see, what's happening here is that as we are experiencing, as our souls and our hearts are transformed by the love of God, your life and my life becomes a gateway, becomes an opportunity to display the love of God everywhere else. Wouldn't it be amazing if that's how you and I were known. Oh, yes, I know him. Yes, I know her. She is just full of God, full of the fullness of God. She oozes the love of God. Friends, when we ooze the love of God, when we are filled to the brim with the love of God, that is what spills out. The scriptures say we love others because God first loved us. So friends, this is it. <laughs> The Christian life isn't about what we do. It's about recognizing, first and foremost, that we are loved beyond what we deserve, beyond what we could even imagine. And so my prayer for you is the prayer that Paul prays for the Ephesians, that you being rooted and established in love would have power to grasp how high and deep and wide and long is the love of God for you. And that you would also be filled to the fullness of Christ, that he may dwell in your hearts through faith. He would take up residence, that you would no longer live your Christian life just by following a map, but you would step into the vast wilderness of his love and be amazed. I wanna challenge you to pray this prayer for you and pray it for others. We can be sin managers or we can be, um, you know, pray for specific things in our life, but friends, if we got even a glimpse, a glimpse more of this love that is in Christ for you and for me, it truly would transform our lives. May it be so.